so uh, in this session, obviously, you know, I don't want this to be a death by PowerPoint. So what I thought we'll do is uh, kind of give you a very brief overview of uh, you know why food science, what is food science, uh, and then do a little bit of a BuzzFeed style, seven common misconceptions about the Indian kitchen that you wish you knew sort of uh, thing. And then, you know, uh, and then spend more time on Q&A. So that's the idea. So for those wondering what food science is, uh, and I'm sure there was a previous session as well. So food science is um, essentially at its most basic level is the idea of understanding what happens when flavor molecules, you know, proteins, you know, carbohydrates and fats interact with each other uh, at various proportions, temperatures and pressures, right? So that's, that's like sort of like the formal textbook uh, definition, if you will, right? Um, more importantly, it's important to understand that a large, a uh, vast majority of us uh, kind of know this intuitively. Uh, we know this intuitively because we cook every day. Uh, we learn uh, from our from our mothers and grandmothers and so on. Um, and simply by obviously watching you know recipe videos on the internet and so on. So we kind of intuitively know this, um, except that this is uh, really just formalizing what happens uh, and and giving you the tools to be able to generalize it uh, where you need to. Right? Um, it is absolutely essential for industrial food production. So anything you buy uh, from a supermarket shelf uh, has been designed and tested by a ton of highly paid food scientists. Um, and food scientists, um, they have a tremendously complex job. Um, it's a job at the intersection of both flavor and taste, as well as pure chemistry, and also health and safety. Right? So you have to be able to make, uh, uh, say, a box of uh, garam masala uh, at industrial scale uh, you can rest assured that it's not the same process that you you know do at home. It has to happen at a much larger scale, um, and so therefore everything from the pH to the uh, to to the temperature and everything and pressures all have to be exactly precise, so that every box that you make tastes exactly the same. Um, and so clearly, it is absolutely essential for food production. So it is largely optional in some sense for the home kitchen. Uh, but here's the point: um, Indian cooking, particularly, is uh, is one of those things that's subject to this uh, history and culture of wanting to eat fresh food all the time. Uh, so there's a history to that, which is that uh, tropical part of the world. Uh, again, you don't know what will happen if you let food sit around for a while in the pre-refrigeration era and so on. So there's been a historical bias towards eating fresh food uh, at any given point of time. And then, you know, a combination of that and patriarchy and all of that essentially means that the woman of the house literally has to cook fresh food uh, three times a day, right? Uh, when you, when you take that and this sort of social and cultural background to this, um, where I think food science can help is that it can help you shorten the amount of time that you spend in the kitchen. Um, it can produce more consistent uh, outcomes and so on. So that's the intent why, uh, that's the intent of really asking people to focus on food science, right? And also, this is a, uh, we also have what we call a documentation and archival problem. Right? So there's no dearth of recipes. Right? So literally every recipe, you know, claiming to be you know, authentic. And so, on. so authenticity is, is a silly concept in food. Right? Your, your dish is about as authentic uh, from the point of view of your house or your family. That's about it. Right? Uh, no two houses you know, uh, do the same dish in the same way. Right? So in that kind of world, uh, just focusing on recipes and not actually on techniques and methods and standardizing them and saying that, look, this is the absolutely perfect way uh, to say, uh, cook rice for biryani uh, or cook rice for a pulao or to make uh, to make to achieve the perfect consistency um, in say an egg curry or to get the perfectly soft uh, marinated chicken and so on so the whole idea is that you know the you know in krishna along with culinary mis I'm sure all of you received, uh, you know, WhatsApp forwards about uh, turmeric and ginger, uh, you know, being able to cure coronavirus uh, and so on, right? So given that we kind of live in that world, so we seem to have a documentation and archival problem. Uh, whereas, you know, if you want to bake bread, right, uh, there are instructions that are precise right down to the number of grams, the, temp the, the pressure, the temperature, the hydration levels, uh, and so on. So this kind of precision is obviously lacking. In, in this part of the world. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we need that level of precision in everything that we do, because the innate nature of a lot of Indian cuisine and the stunning diversity of it essentially means uh, that it's not, uh, there are many ways to get to the same uh, outcome, right? So, and again, I can see the optics of a tech dude coming and tell you, te teaching people about, you know, how to cook and so on. Uh, so it's important to say, grandmothers don't know food science, right? But they know cooking. Right? 
And that's the knowledge that counts. So tacit knowledge, if you know how to make delicious food, that's the knowledge that counts. What food science will help you with is to figure out what parts of that knowledge are actually scalable and usable in other ways, right? And what is misinformation and what is not misinformation. So that's the, the larger goal of really thinking about food science. Okay. So now let me do the, the BuzzFeed thing of, uh, uh, of using seven common misconceptions as starting points for conversations about seven important things, um, uh, science things in the Indian kitchen, right? So we'll sort of start with the misconception and then uh, we'll uh, talk a little bit about, uh, uh, kind of go on a tangent, uh, related tangents, if you will, on some of these subjects. Okay. So um, I'll start with a legend uh, that I'm going to be using in this, in this presentation. So for each of these misconceptions, um, I will either have a reaction that goes this, which essentially means, uh, so, or this, um, or, or this, right? So what these actually mean is, if it's that, I want you to reconsider the way you're thinking about it. Perhaps you're getting the right outcomes, but not for the reasons you think you are. So that's what that, uh, that legend, uh, that's what that emoji means. This one means, really, you know, I think you're getting it wrong. I think the, the science behind it is entirely wrong. Um, and this one is, I literally have no words, which is that this is just blatant misinformation. And more importantly, this is misinformation that's probably crept in uh, in a more recent time as a result of the internet and not simply because uh, uh, this misinformation has been around since the past and so on, right? So these are the three things that I will use to sort of describe each of these uh, uh, so uh, mis misconceptions. So let me start with a very simple and a very basic and seemingly very trivial one, but we'll go off on a discussion about uh, multiple topics that I think will be relevant, right? One of the first misconceptions that I wanted to talk about is, is you will find recipes telling you that uh, when you're making noodles, especially egg noodles, not, not necessarily Maggie, uh, uh, when you boil the noodles or you know, sort of par cook the noodles in hot water ahead of time before adding it to your gravy and so on, or whatever it is that you're, whatever style you're making it in, they will tell you that to prevent the noodles from sticking, you're to add a few drops of water into the hot water uh, when you boil, right? And it will prevent it from sticking. Well, no, it doesn't, right? So here's so now here's the here's here's the science behind it, right? Let's first start with what actually works. If your intent is to prevent noodles from sticking um, after you have cooked it, you have to cool it down in room temperature water or an ice bath in some sense, and then add a teaspoon of oil or so and sort of mix it up. Because at that point of time, the oil will then coat the, the noodles and then prevent it from sticking to each other, right? So now let's kind of explore why this happens in the first place. One, why, why do noodles stick, right? Why does rice stick? Uh, why do any starches stick? So let's first, have, we have to understand what happens when you cook carbohydrates or starches, right? So that's the, that's the real science uh, behind this, uh, understanding this whole thing. And why adding fats in this context seems to work, but not in the other context. For starters, let's get the misconception out of the way. Adding a teaspoon of so uh, oil to water uh, literally means that the oil is going to float right on top because oil and water do not mix. Uh, why do oil and water do not mix? Because water is a polarized molecule because the oxygen part of water is strongly negatively charged and the hydrogen part of water is positively charged. This is in fact why water kind of sticks together and is liquid at room temperature, right? So uh, in fact, most molecules that are that similar tend to be gases, but water is special, right? Water is liquid. And in fact, if not for water being liquid at room or comfortable temperatures, there wouldn't be the kind of diversity of life that we have uh, on this planet. So that's, that's, for a, that's, a, that's for a separate talk. But in the context of food, this is important. The reason why oils don't mix with water is because uh, fats uh, do not have polarized ends that can then get attracted uh, to the water, right? So when you put salt, the sodium and chloride are actually, again, positively and negatively charged, and they go neatly kind of combined with the opposite charges in water, and that's what dissolving actually means. And oil, on the other hand, does not uh, dissolve into water, right? So what this essentially means is that a tiny bit of oil added uh, to your uh, water is absolutely going to do nothing except stay on the surface, right? Here's what happens when you actually cook starch, right? When you cook starch at about 65 or 70 Celsius, uh, the starch undergoes a process called gelatinization, right? So this is essentially when any kind of starch, be it potato, rice, dal, you name it, right? Kind of goes soft and mushy, right? So that's what we mean by, you know, it's cooked at this point, right? So this process, uh, if you go a little bit deep, um, happens as a result of two kinds of starch molecules. So literally all the starchy foods you have, have two kinds of starch molecules, amylose and amylopectin, right? 
Amylose is the one that kind of becomes a jelly thing, but not sticky, right? So jelly hard kind of thing, but not sticky. So the cooked rice grain, right, still maintains its structure as a result of amylose, right, when, when it cooks. On the other hand, the other starch, which is amylopectin, is, is the one that causes all the stickiness, right? So this is why you wash off all of the amylopectin uh, from any starchy thing before you cook. Right? So that's the white uh, surface thing that comes when you wash rice. That's a lot of the amylopectin, surface amylopectin, which, by the way, after the starch is cooked, turns into a sticky goo um, and then makes everything stick. And this happens to noodles as well. Right. So that is why washing it till the water runs clear, you know, till you know, the rice water runs clear or noodles before cooking and also then adding the fat after it's cooked is what will prevent from all of that amylopectin from sticking to each other. So that's basically the science behind why uh, this works this way, right? Uh, let me give you another small tip before we move to the next one, is that the one situation where adding water um, to, uh, adding fat to water actually works when you're boiling water is when you're cooking dal, right? So when you're pressure cooking dal, one annoying thing that happens is that it forms. A lot of that yellow frothy substance comes out of that, uh, uh, the weight and it also kind of comes uh, clogs up your uh, safety valve and so on and it, you know wrecks your uh, pressure cooker lid right over time and it's very tough to wash as well so you can significantly reduce that if you add a teaspoon of oil uh, so this is uh, one tip that you can remember which is if you add a teaspoon of oil when you're making dal that will prevent the pressure cooking from uh, pressure